let's get started on this. There's a few more that are probably going to be popping in. For those of you who have joined us recently, um, your mic is going to be muted until you raise your hand with a question. Um, and when we are able to call on you for raising your hand, then we'll uh, unmute you and, and listen to your question at that point. So, except for Paul. Paul, you're on the line here somewhere. Um, oh, I'm here. Okay. All right. Great. So, so we're going to talk about pediatric leg length inequality. So, one of the, when we were presenting this, one of the first things we wanted to to set up. First of all, this is a, a picture we found, um, and you can see the little girl on the right, um, and and that what's going on with her postural pattern. Uh, it seems pretty apparent that she may be dealing with a structural leg length inequality pretty early on in life. Uh, and something that these are the kind of kids we would love to catch and we want to tell you why. So the first thing we're going to look at is, if I can get the thing to work, there we go, is prevalence. Is how common is leg length inequality? I mean, many of you have been through our Posturology 101 class. We talked about this a little bit. But when we were presenting this up at uh, Tiffany, uh, one of the first things we wanted to explain is, is how prevalent is leg length inequality. And this is a, a graph from the um, Chiropractic Osteopathic Journal published in 2005 um, showing over about a 3,000 person study um, what is the prevalence of leg length inequality. And the prevalence at each millimeter is, is how they broke it down. Um, so zero. The people who have zero millimeters of difference is right around 10% of the people, uh, meaning that 90% of us do have some sort of leg length inequality. Uh, the ones we are most concerned with, and this is from Travell, for those of you who have a Travell and, and know about the, her copy of her book, is the five millimeters or more. Um, five millimeters or more turns out to be about 58, 59% of the people fall into the category of five millimeters or more. So we, we recognize that it's a, a pretty large group of people. Um, and so what can we do about maybe making that group smaller is kind of what the question we're asking. So here it is broken down for you. Zero to four millimeters is 41.3%. 5 to 9 millimeters is 37.4. Greater than that is 20%. So if 41.3 are under 5 millimeters, that means 58.7% are 5 millimeters or more. Um, making it, we think, you know, one of the biggest missed pieces of healthcare, uh, to tell you the truth, is that you'll see why and, and what this can cause later on. So. I, I just want to chip in here. Sure. Uh, just one little thing about prevalence. I, I saw four new patients today, um, and uh, I, I sent three of them out uh, today for, for uh, leg length X-rays. So I, I was I was running at about seventy-five percent today. But that's that's our practice, and that may be the case for for many of you out there who are treating people in pain. You might notice that the, there's more than more than that fifty-nine percent coming through your door. Uh, but those are the people who are in pain. So. Uh, they are seeking you out for treatment. Absolutely. And I mean, I saw two new patients today, and actually both of them had a leg length. So that's, what's that, five for six? Yeah. <laughs> Between yeah. the two of us? Paul, did you see anybody today? Uh, yes, I did. It's uh, six for seven. <laughs> All right. There you go. So there you go. Now now our percentages are hitting a little more like we see at our clinic. Um, and these are structural differences. That's what I wanted to to. Maybe we can come back and see. Incidence, it's called anatomic leg length inequality, uh, which as opposed to the functional leg length inequality. Because one of my patients actually came in with a heel lift uh, that I had to take her out of because the chiropractor had corrected her for a functional inequality with a heel lift. And we're not talking about a functional inequality. We're talking about a structural difference, an actual difference in the length of the bone. So, so here's a – so – Okay, so what? So they have a leg length inequality. You have to understand why it's clinically significant. So here's a couple of studies here. This is um, 
Incidence of lower limb length inequality in 653 patients with chronic low back pain and 359. This is done by Orr Freiberg. Um, it, it was published actually back in 1983 and broke it down into percentages 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, 15 or more. And then broke it down into this is the low back group. What percentage has that? This is the symptom-free group. What percentage has that? So you'll see the zero to four, which are the people that that the body does does the best with. Twenty-four percent in the low back group were in that that area, but fifty-six percent in the symptom-free group. So that means a much higher percentage of the people who are of zero to four millimeters of inequality are symptom-free than they are have low back pain. Now as you start to go up higher in numbers, you'll notice over here in the symptom-free group, the percentage gets smaller and smaller and smaller. There's only, what, 2.2% of the people that have 15 millimeters or more that have no low back pain. <clears throat> and, and again, they're just looking at low back pain. We don't know if they have knee pain or hip pain or neck pain or migraine headaches or anything like that. But still, just with low back, you'll see the majority of the people in the low back group, 45% of them, are in that 5 to 9 millimeter range. And actually, both of my patients today were in that 5 to 9 millimeter range, which we think is a pretty critical range. Um, so the this is a pretty good study. I mean, 653 people, that's that's a pretty good group. And you'll notice they're soldiers, um, so their age is, is relatively young. Um, so we think as this population got older, these numbers would work out to all of these, these bigger groups over here ending up with lower back pain eventually. Um, and here we go, break it down, less than 5 millimeters, 5 millimeters or more, 10 millimeters or more. This is her just breaking, or him, sorry. That's a him, Dr. Freiberg is a him. Um, breaking it down into the ratio uh, of which group is, so there it is, that 5 to 1 in that 15 millimeters or more. And over here, there's much more in the symptom-free group. So not only are we talking about lower back pain, um, let's look at sciatica here and unilateral hip symptoms. So sciatica, 228 people with sciatica. <clears throat> Not only does it break it down into, of those people, which they also broke it down into the longer leg and the shorter leg. And you'll see it, you are far more likely, uh, three times more likely to have sciatica on the long leg than you are on the short leg. That, that's a number that that makes it show that there is some clinical significance to sciatica and leg length inequality. Now in unilateral hip symptoms, it's even a bigger percentage difference. <clears throat> um, the longer leg, 88.9% of unilateral hip symptoms. And it's my experience, I, I don't know if Kevin or Paul wants to chime in here, but my experience that that's also the hip that they end up getting a hip replacement on as they get older. Is that <clears throat> what you guys have run into? Uh, definitely. Um, and that's because in the long leg, uh, the individual has an earlier heel strike. Uh, which causes a superior push into the joint. And then as they go into the swing phase and they transfer weight to the lower leg, um, the soft tissues absorb that shock, uh, particularly, particularly the tensor fasciolata and iliotibial band. But on the long leg, the joints, uh, and particularly the hip joint, but I might also add, uh, for the number of people that you see who have knee replacements, um, there's going to be a significant tilt towards the short leg side. And so what you'll see is th that in the knee that basically should be a hinge joint with very little sideways movement, that on the long leg side you'll see 
uh, wearing away of the meniscus on the long leg side and then on the short leg side and where they wear the meniscus away because think of the femurs just tilting. So let's take the example of a person with a right short leg. When they transfer weight to that left leg, they tilt from the knee joint up in the postural chain towards the short leg side. So what that usually means is that they will wear out the meniscus on the inside of the long leg and on the outside of the short leg. And I've seen that over and over and over again with the knee replacements and hip replacements. So I think that superior push is extremely important. Now, not all of the sciatica in leg length differential is caused by um, herniated discs. Uh, there are significant um, number of people who get entrap soft tissue entrapment. Now what is documented in the literature is the piriformis muscle pressing down on the sciatic nerve. What is not generally looked at is the muscles below the sciatic nerve pushing up. And this is what happens significantly on the long leg side. So it's muscles like the gomeli and operator muscles that push up and cause a soft tissue entrapment where the sciatic nerve goes through this sciatic notch. Um, and this is well uh, illustrated in the Bachin charts because you see that opening, which is only about the size of a quarter. Uh, so oftentimes you see uh, people who have significant sciatic symptoms, but the symptoms are actually a soft tissue entrapment uh, caused by the lower muscles pushing up on the high side. You see a lot more of the pure classical piriformis uh, entrapment on the short leg side as that as the ilium and hip is uh, being pushed down and so from the top the piriformis would be the entrapping structure and on the long leg side it would be the um, glomeli and operator muscles actually pushing up into the sciatic nerve. <clears throat> so, thanks Paul. Um, the, I think we've established that there are a lot of people that have leg length inequality and that leg length inequality is clinically significant. That, that the, oh, there we go. Um, so we'll get to some further research here in a second. But the other thing we want to show you here, um, here's one other thing is establishing the clinical significance of leg length inequality, is that what happens when you correct it? Um, and so here's a, a group, uh, they list it by symptom, uh, low back pain, sciatica, and hip symptoms. <clears throat> and of the people that were corrected, how many of them became symptom free? how many of them had alleviated pain, and how many of them had no relief. And you'll see that, that the low back pain, this is without therapy. This is just lifting of the shoe. Seventy-five percent of the people were symptom-free, had no symptoms after that. Um, sciatica, 73 percent. Hip symptoms, 70 percent. So all of those people were alleviated by putting in a full foot lift. Um, then you have another 15% in about each category uh, that had, some, had alleviated pain, but some of it was still there, and an average of around 9 to 13% of people that had no relief at all. Um, so we think these people could get better with some therapy, but you'll see how effective just putting the lift in. Um, you're talking about, you know, three quarters of the people that, that get better without much therapy and actually just giving them a lift. And this, they, this group was followed between, do you remember this chart, Kevin? 18 months? Is that right? 
I, I think it was about that, yes. About 18 months that they followed them um, after the, the lift. And even after 18 months, about three-quarters of them still symptom-free. So, so that tells you, I mean, a little bit about how important it is to correct. That's, that's a, the other way you, you s establish clinical significance. Um, I'm going to come back here just a little bit. So there's a few other things that could be read um, in pediatric orthopedics. There's some more information. If you have any questions, you can email us. We can give you all sorts of references for leg length inequality. Um, and and there'll be some when you get a recording of this. Um, these are further research that needs to be done. We need to check out some inter-rater reliability and some other ideas that we have. Um, but but for for the purposes of the pediatric leg length inequality, which is what we're talking about, um, we want to say that it is out there. the The significance is is pretty large. Um, and it's clinically significant in causing at least these three pain symptoms. Uh, we as a, a clinic see a lot more. Um, I mean, how many times do you see an atlas that won't stay in place because there's a leg length inequality or, you know, which causes their migraine headaches, which, yeah, there's all sorts of things that can be caused by this. Uh, there's some studies out there showing knee osteoarthritis uh, with leg length inequality. There's several things pointing towards this. So we know it's out there. We know it's important. Um, here's, here's what we want to say is, so that was more of an adult population, but here's a study actually showing the prevalence in a uh, pediatric population uh, in elementary school, junior high, senior high. Um, now, this was pelvic asymmetries. This was not done by x-rays. This was done by palpation. <clears throat> um, but you'll see that the number of imbalance, the percent imbalance, so the number of 187 people they measured, 112 of them were imbalanced, 75%. Um, and then in junior high, it's even greater. <laughs> in senior high, it's even greater. 92% of these kids are not in balance. Um, and it's a couple hundred kids that they're measuring. So it's letting you know it is pretty prevalent out there. For some reason, this study showed the left being low a little more often than the right being low. I don't know if that's statistically significant enough, though. Um, but this study then broke it down into <clears throat> pre-test, post-tests. Uh, they actually gave them a lift over a period of time. And there was indication, which you may see here, starting standing imbalance, 47 subjects they looked at, corrected standing balance. This means after they wore their lift for a period of one year, they re took the lift out and retested. And 27 of the 29 actually corrected their leg length inequality. It, it went back to balance. Um, so that's pretty significant number. Um, and again, we, we'll get you this study. You can break down the whole thing. We've got, got the whole study out there. So um, it's, the problem, there was a couple of problems with this study, and, and I'll tell you what they were. Is, again, they just measured the PSIS. That's not nearly as accurate as taking an x-ray. Um, it it's a, can be a functional measurement as opposed to a structural measurement. Um, so there were some problems with this study. But it was enough to show that there, it may warrant further looking into is what it may. So what we want to present tonight are a couple of the cases we've seen here in the clinic um, in correcting pediatric leg length inequality and what, what we're seeing here on a on a day to day basis. Uh, and can I can I uh, just clarify a little bit? Sure. Um, uh, when when Randy says correcting leg length, uh, pediatric leg length uh, inequality, we're not talking about correcting it like we correct in adults. We're talking about eliminating uh, pediatric 
leg length inequality. Yes. Uh, this is what this is what our our case history and some of this research that we're studying uh, is is in this indicating. We we're, we're looking at the elimination of the leg length discrepancy, not just a correction by the use of the lift for for the rest of their lives. So I just wanted to, to make sure everybody's clear on that. Um, that very very big <coughs> distinction about what we're yes. talking about. Yes, and, and it starts with a correction. Yes, <laughs> it starts with a lift is what it starts with. And so here, this first case, uh, let me just set this up for you. She's 17, um, so she's actually gr getting towards the end of the growing stage. You'll see not a lot in the way of growth plates left, but there's, what we're going to find with her is that there probably is more than we think. Um, <clears throat> bilateral knee pain, worse on the left, a couple times, two to three times a week, and it lasts for two to three days. So. It's there most of the time, this pain on, the, on her left knee. Um, left hip pain um, has been there, it's about two to three times a week for about two to three days. So red flags already with this, this unilateral hip pain, right? We already talked about that. Um, she's been horseback riding two to three times per week. Uh, had a diagnosis of tendinitis and loose knee ligaments. Under x-ray, we, we took a, a standing AP pelvic x-ray, the way Travell indicates, um, found out she had an 11 millimeter leg length inequality. Um, so this is uh, actually her first chart. This is the kind of thing that you would be seeing as you chart the people. Um, you'll see a she had a wedge pattern, which is a little bit unusual for the 10 millimeters or more. A um, little too much flexion, <clears throat> but here's here's the big indicator right here. Oh, oh, that's what just happened. <laughs> um, right, 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 there we go. Uh, this is this over here in the supine position. Uh, you'll see that the tibial tuberosity measurement is uneven, but the greater trochanter is even. Um, so we saw her. That you'll see the date was eleven twenty oh nine. Now we saw her again 9:21:10 because she had fallen off a horse and hurt herself. <clears throat> um, and what you'll see is she hasn't been wearing her lift. She was 17. She didn't want to wear a lift. Um, and so she's now 18, and she now has a 17 millimeter leg length inequality. Um, so it went from 11 to 17, and and got worse over that time. Um, you also see she has some pelvic flexion issues, and that was from the fall, so 10 months since the previous x-ray, not wearing a lift for the previous six months. So she wore it for a little bit and then didn't. Um, she was recently thrown off a horse. Her lower back pain and knee pain has increased since the last time she was in. And now she has pelvic flexion and leg length. So we convinced her it was really important to wear her lift at this point. Um, and this was Paul's patient, so feel free to chime in whenever you want here, Paul. Um, and well, actually, you called her mother in and, okay. and said, Look, uh, I, w I wasn't going to see her unless she, I pointed out the difference, um, particularly I was alarmed at the increase because she had gone through a growth spurt. Um, and uh, the difference in the flexion between the right side and the left side wasn't there the first lift. So, and then, you know, she admitted actually a, a chiropractor had talked her out of wearing the lift and said it w wasn't really relevant. That's why that was another factor of why she stopped uh, wearing the lift. Um, but then she went for some adjustments and nothing helped her, so they came back and I said, well, um, you know, I'll help you get out of pain, but I'm not going to keep seeing you if you're not serious about correcting this. So both her mother and she promised that she would now start wearing the lift. And uh, I think we probably have a third x-ray here. We do. Okay. <clears throat> so she started wearing a lift for five months. Um, and now after wearing that lift, we've gotten her, her difference is now down to seven millimeters. So she actually had a little more growth left in her and enough to make up the uh, 10 millimeters of difference. 
Um, and so from her original, you can go back to her original, which started out as the 11, then she went up to the 17, and now back down to 7 after wearing the lift for a period of time. Now, at some point, those growth plates are going to fuse, and her growth is going to be done, and she's going to be stuck at whatever difference is there um, and have to deal with that for the rest of her life. Um, our idea is to try to get that number down as low as possible. Um, and the earlier, now this is a 17-year-old, the earlier we can catch it, the more likely we are to get that down under that 5 millimeters where this person wouldn't need a lift anymore. That's what we're looking to do. Uh, so we'll look at one more case here. This is a 9-year-old. Um, had acid reflux, that's why they came to us, acid reflux and GERD, um, abdominal pain, described as sharp, burning, and radiating, had a 10 millimeter leg length inequality. And what you'll notice here, not only a leg length inequality, but what we see often with it is a small hemipelvis. <clears throat> this person has a 6 millimeter small hemipelvis, is what, what they had. Um, so, Paul saw this person. Do you remember this this young lady? Um, uh, is is that a a, a girl or yes, a boy? Yes, this is actually a girl. Um, she had that abdominal pain. Then here's her, actually uh, this this will help. There's her chart. <laughs> um, small hemi pelvis, short leg. Uh, it's kind of the same idea started wearing a, a foot lift for the last 14 months. So this is a little over a year later. Um, and that difference has gone now from a 10 to a 6. So we've had to lower. So x-ray reveals a 6 millimeter short leg, but has not been wearing her ischial lift. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now that ischial difference has gone from a 6 millimeter difference to an 8 millimeter difference. You'll see that 12 minus 4 is now 8 <clears throat> millimeters of ish. So it got worse, but the leg got better. <laughs> so when you corrected the leg, the leg got better, but when you didn't do anything about the ischial lift, it got worse over that year and a half, year and two months. Yeah, I actually uh, brought her mother, who's a dentist, in, and we sat down and talked about compliance in her patients, and, and uh, this is why this had gotten worse, and so her daughter promised at that point that she would wear the issue lift also. And, and what you'll see, there's still a lot of growth. See these lines, these growth plates? This is still a young girl, so there's a lot of growing left to do. So we now go... You can point out the pelvic... Uh, growth plates uh, that are sticking out there on the inside uh, that look like oh. fracture lines. Yeah. There you right go. There. There's some um, pelvic growth plates. Yeah. And so they're, they're very active uh, still. Yep. So she's still, I mean, she was 9 when we first started, so now she's 10 <coughs> here. Um, and now 17 months later, so she's closing in on 12. Uh, she started wearing her ischial lift, and she started she wear her leg lift, and now her difference is three millimeters. So we're under that zero to five, which is great. We've got that, and the ischial has gone to a three millimeter difference as well. Um, after she started sitting on it, instead of getting bigger, it actually caught up, got smaller. And now she only has a three millimeter ischial difference. So th this is a couple of the cases um, that that they wore it and they got better. We also have cases of them not wearing it and them not getting better. Um, the, does one of the things they showed? If you want to, I'm going to just scroll back here for a moment. Uh, in this chart here is that these are the same group of people, this 187 and this 187, um, that if you, and this is untreated, they just 
measured them over the years. Uh, if you, they did nothing about it and measured those same people um, a few years later, what, five years later, and the number of imbalanced actually went up. Um, it didn't get, they don't get better on their own. Uh, that if you leave them alone, they, the, it's not a spontaneous getting better with growth. It's really only those that you end up correcting, which are the ones that we're talking about here, these, that you end up correcting that actually end up getting better. Um, so we wanted to, there's a, a couple of things. I mean, there, obviously, this presents itself as we need some more study on it. Um, we think we have enough to to get a real study together, which is why we presented this to Tiffany, and we're working with her to try to <clears throat> organize a a actual study, showing you know doing a hopefully getting a group of school age children and just going through and measuring each of them and and finding the ones that that do have these differences and correcting them while they while they can still grow and still make up the difference. Uh, we th really think all of those people with those low back, sciatica, hip pains can be prevented if we correct this early enough. Uh, one of the things that Paul taught me early on was that when you find a leg length inequality on someone, you ask about their kids. Um, and you ask about their parents <laughs> because it is it does seem to be a genetically linked trait and it's something that if you can catch these kids early enough you can really change their destiny uh, and I mean when when you really start thinking about it that's a really big deal so, so Randy uh, I'm gonna uh, open up to a, a question here that sure. we, we've got in uh, Elizabeth had a question about uh, Ischial lifts. Uh, Elizabeth, you are unmuted. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Uh, my question is, how does an Ischial lift help someone make up small hemi pelvis growth? That's a great question, Elizabeth. We don't know. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> it's only by case study that we even know it exists. Um, is that only because we have these studies and we have these kids and when they don't wear their lift it doesn't get any smaller and when they do when their parents do make them wear sit on their lift it changes and it somehow speeds up the growth of the smaller side we assume maybe it slows down the growth of the bigger side we don't know <laughs> um, there there hasn't been enough study to tell you the mechanism behind it but we've got enough you know, case studies, I'm, I'm sure Paul will back me up on this, um, that show that when they do start, when they actually comply, that this gets smaller, and it does seem to get smaller. How how quickly, Paul? I mean, six months? How how quick are yeah, you seeing it, a change? It, yeah, it definitely does. And in, in, in the case of uh, the young boy that really spurred our inference, uh, interest in uh, seeing these children every three months is that we had a 10-year-old boy correct seven millimeters. He went through a growth spurt and he corrected seven millimeters in three months, which we didn't know that was possible until we actually saw him. You remember that case we're talking about? I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And now I, I can surmise, and what I think happens, Elizabeth, is that when you transfer weight off that short leg side, it has a decompression uh, of the epiphyseal points, these growth rates. And that allows for uh, greater osteoblastic activity in these epiphyseal joints. That's what I think happens. I don't know how we're going to prove exactly how it happens. But it only makes sense that if a joint is compressed, it doesn't respond. And the purpose of a growth plate is to be able to initiate further growth, which means elongation uh, of the um, bone itself. Uh, because once the these uh, fifth seal joints are fused, then you've got what you've got. We have seen, although we've seen quite a few people making claims that they're changing leg length difference, we haven't actually 
uh, seen that through uh, x-ray proof. Uh, so we think it has to do with deloading and having actually less physical weight on the short leg side. And the body it starts accelerating the growth of the legs and of the hips because some people have scoliosis and don't have a leg length difference, but they have a, a, a hemipelvis difference. Um, I saw a lady today uh, from Italy who has a six millimeter leg length difference and an 11 millimeter hemipelvis difference. Uh, so we, we want to lift up um, her when she's sitting. She's actually more dysfunctional when she, she's standing, and we've seen a lot of people like that. Then we've seen some people with no leg length difference, but a scoliosis and a, uh, uh, say, 11 millimeter hemipelvis. So that's also documented in uh, uh, Travell's uh, uh, second book, Chapter 4, in the early part of uh, Chapter 4 on hemipelvises. So we think that's what happens is that the actual uh, transfer of weight and uh, it's about one-third more of body weight that's on the short leg side, and it actually gets bigger as the leg length uh, difference is, is bigger. So, for example, if you had a five millimeter leg length, you wouldn't have as much weight being transferred to the short leg side as if you had a, a 10 or 12 millimeter leg length difference. Um, the other significant thing that, that I would point out, Elizabeth, is that all our patients get instructed on how to walk because what you see with young children is that they've developed a wobbling pattern almost always and so they can't move in a proper cross pattern because their their, their arms are going from side to side so they tend to just uh, have their hands at their sides. They don't have a true cross patterning and that seems to be a stimulant too that when when kids get serious and their parents get serious about because their parents usually notice that they they say things like, oh, my kid walks like a duck or like a farmer, or they have these, you know, colloquialism to describe aberrant uh, gait patterns which they've noticed in their children, um, but they don't know the significance of correcting it or what could possibly cause that. Well, we, we look at that, and um, so we, we talk about how important that is, and, and we think it is important because it, it further facilitates proper uh, mechanics of the spine uh, to initiate a cross pattern. Uh, it, it creates better coordination, um, and all of that creates um, better entropy. Now, the, the term entropy means the amount of biological energy available in any biological system. And when you have children that walk so aberrantly, a lot of biological energy is being wasted. When that energy is not wasted, it goes into repairing, recovering, uh, creating immune function, uh, but it also goes into growth because that's part of good immune function in the child. So I, I think there's, a, there's an energetic component to it. Uh, there's a actual structural decompression component to it. Um, and maybe we'll have to, and I'm not sure how we're going to prove that in, in studies, but it should be something that we, we look at, we look at, and, um, um, and I'm sure we'll do it in, in the study because it's part of our educational program with the children and with the parents. Uh, and we, th we have noticed that children do a lot better when they walk biomechanically correct. Um, as opposed to uh, children who don't change their gait patterns or, or don't comply, as, as we talked about in uh, these two cases. All right. I think uh, we're going to open up to another question here. Uh, Rhoda, uh, taking you off of mute there. Go ahead and ask your question. Do we still have Rhoda Larson online? Okay, I guess not. All right. 
So, um, uh, do we have uh, questions coming from anyone else here? Uh, remember to use the little uh, raise your hand button if you've got a question. Uh, let's go to Greg Young. Um, there you go. You're Kevin? open now. Yes. What's your okay, question? Okay, great. Well, uh, more of a comment. This is uh, I really this is really interesting, and I would uh, suggest that when you do set up your your project, um, to follow them pa even past their their growth phases, you know, even into adulthood, uh, if you could do a long range study and see these children that do get the correction in the absence of any trauma, uh, their incidence of low back pain relative to a normal population or a population you might see that has leg length inequality throughout their life. It, it, certainly there's there's all kinds of factors that, that we have to uh, work into uh, the 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 research that we do um, and and how we are uh, using control groups uh, um, um, children who, who do have a pain in their low back has there been an injury um, you know uh, it, it, this this <laughs> the the when Randy and I were discussing this um, this this project and and looking at all of the branches and tendrils and 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 spiraling bits of research that could come off of uh, just the the uh, the idea that we've started with here uh, we kind of looked at each other and said w you know we're going to be seventy five by the time we finish with all of this <laughs> um, uh, so you know. And, and, and this is and this is where we uh, hope to to look to the students of our uh, of the future and and the students who have been through our program in the past um, to to um, take these these bits of these foundations of research that we start with and 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 repeat the the research and add their own um, uh, factors into it and and so that we create this body of knowledge. Um, and uh, so, so all of these different pieces of, of uh, uh, variable um, are, are part of that that body of knowledge that we're going to to end up with uh, by the time we're 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 well into this. So sounds great. To take your thought a little further, Greg, <clears throat> what we really wanted to do is follow these people, <laughs> right? Correct their leg length inequality, have it cr catch up, and then see their kids and see do their kids inherit this leg length inequality or because you corrected it young enough did it change the DNA they pass on to their children you know could could you correct it to the point that you could eliminate leg length inequality in the future um, and, and stop it being passed along if you correct it in these kids early enough uh, you know that this is something we could study for years and years and years and years and years <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And and it it does. It spawns all these wonderful questions and ideas and and further, you know. And that's what the school is going to be about. Um, is that every person who goes to our school has to do some sort of research project. I'm sure some of them will be related to leg length inequality and and can take the next step. And each graduating class gets to take the next step and go further and further. Well, incidentally, in these two cases that you presented, uh, the second case, the young girl, her father has a 10 millimeter leg length difference. Uh, her mother doesn't. And the case before that, it's the mother who had a leg length difference and the father who didn't. Um, but, uh, and I, and so actually if I see a child, I ask about their parents, if they have chronic pain. Uh, the mother of, of the first child uh, actually had migraines, um, and which corrected with the leg with the, a lift. And uh, the father of the second case had uh, low back pain, which uh, and a herniated disc in his neck, uh, both of which cleared up with the with the lift and and uh, some some therapy. Uh, I think maybe about ten treatments to get rid of there. In his neck. So, um, so yeah. those, those, you know, the lift really helps, but you're not going to, they're done growing. So right. they're going to need yeah. to wear their lift for the rest of their life is what they're going to end up doing. So here's a, here's a follow-up question, and, and I got this uh, texted to me here from Rhoda. We'll see if, if Rhoda is, is on audio here now. Uh, are, are you with us, Rhoda? 
Okay, I guess we're not getting Rhoda's audio, but the question is, do these children experience pain when using the heel and ischial lifts? Okay, so one thing right off the bat I want to clarify um, is that, that we are not at all, uh, from here until the end of time, we will never ever be talking about a heel lift. Okay, um, uh, we are talking about a full foot lift, uh, extending all the way from the heel through the transverse arch uh, of the foot. Um, we, we, can, we can document and we have all kinds of evidence that shows that the heel lifts are actually causing more distortion uh, than, than they are correcting. So um, I'll throw the rest of that question over to uh, Randy or Paul. Um, do, as, as the kids are wearing these lifts and using the, the, the sit lifts, uh, what, what are they experiencing? Um, uh, any, any of this uh, rebound pain that we talk about with adults? Uh, n not no. In my yeah, my experience is no. <laughs> um, uh, they're much more pliable, and and they ad adapt much quicker than any adult I've ever put into a lift. Um, so I yeah, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I've never had any issue at all. But no, their their bodies are so elastic that uh, they you know when you ask them they they think it's like a strange question. Well, no, yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, uh, so they, the older you, uh, a person gets, the more uh, rebound accommodation it's called uh, is more difficult. So when you're trying to correct this in people that are, you know, uh, in their 70s and 80s, uh, it's you may have to take a gradual approach, especially if it's you know 10 millimeters or more, um, and doing it at stages. And that's another thing we need to research because we don't know what those those stages are actually, but um, uh, kids under uh, 18 years of age, uh, I don't think they've ever complained, and, I, and I've seen a lot of children and really can't recall any child who ever complained about the uh, lift. The, the only uh, children that complain about it are usually girls and that's aesthetic complaints. Initially they think everybody's going to be watching saying, oh, you've got a lift in your shoe and then when, when nobody does. Uh, but that's the biggest complaint is aesthetics, but not really discomfort at all. No, I've, I've never run into any, not, not one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. Yeah. Uh, let's go to another question here. Um, Beth Ann, uh, are you there with us? I heard something. Beth, we hear something, you, Beth Ann. Did you say for me, Beth Ann? Yes, yes, okay. yes Beth Ann. What's um, your question? So, I, um, so it seems like you're 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 sort of guessing that there's a genetic component to the leg length, but since it's like ninety percent of the population, I mean, I know that in some cases it's like a fall or it could be birth trauma or something that's causing these leg length things, and it's not necessarily passed on genetically. I mean, are, are you? pretty much thinking it's just the way you develop without trauma. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, I would say 90% is what, of what we're seeing is without trauma, is that most of these kids have not had any major trauma um, take place. When you find some of the very large leg length inequalities, the 30 millimeter, the 40 millimeter, those are normally trauma-induced, from my experience. Uh, they had a damaged growth plate or something broke their leg at a young age, something around those, or polio or something like that that may have stunted the growth. Um, but I would say, I, would, would you kind of back me up on this probably, guys, about 90% of your leg length, maybe yeah. more, are yeah, yeah. genetic? And there's, there's a very interesting dental study. It's a classic study in dentistry. Um, it's called the Price Pottinger uh, study from the Price Pottinger Foundation. And this was conducted in uh, Australia with cats. Um, and they took uh, cats through four generations. Um, and what they did is they started taking their normal 
raw diets and introducing uh, cooked foods and then uh, very cooked foods. And by the fourth generation, well, actually by the second generation, they started seeing narrow arches, crowding of teeth, orthodontic problems uh, among these cats. So the fourth generation, even the excreta was so toxic that weeds wouldn't grow in their pens. Now this is a, a, a very well documented uh, study uh, that shows deterioration of dental arches, a crowding of teeth, uh, the development of breathing patterns and high arches that actually crowded into the sinus cavities. Uh, and, and this was a fa and the factor that they looked at was nutrition. And the first thing they noticed in these bats, before even the dental arch changes and the breathing changes and forward head postures and things like that, was leg length inequality. So there may be a nutritional component to this uh, also. But we, we, we have quite a few studies where we've seen great grandmother and, and, and then grandma and mother. We, we've seen four generations, and this is carried on. Uh, it's not always the same identical bone, though. For example, in one one parent, it may be the femur, and then the other parent, it may be the right femur, where it was the left femur by the mother. Um, but we're convinced there's a genetic component to this uh, because we've seen it so frequently. Uh, so we always want we we uh, early on started asking people, well, do you have any children? Uh, because it can be a very self-correcting mechanism, as you've seen with these two case studies, if the growth plates are still active. Um, so there's a lot to learn here. Uh, and we may get some resistance about the nutritional aspect of this. But indeed, the, the thing that made us say, hey, we've got to look at this and create a study was uh, this 10-year-old boy just uh, recently um, he has two sisters. They both have leg length differences. The father doesn't, but the mother does. Uh, now, in this particular family, uh, they all have the same bone. It's the femur bone, and it's all on the same side. Uh, but we've seen other, other families where it does go from right to left. But this, this is a family that is very conscientious. They eat uh, mostly organic. And we've noticed that in families where the nutrition is, is very much foremost in those families, the children definitely correct faster and bigger than uh, children who eat a lot of refined sugar and refined foods. Uh, it happens slower. Um, and and there's, there's no question about that, that that's a component of this because we've and we didn't know that uh, um, previously we'd seen a, a girl, again, with parents are very conscientious, change four millimeters in six months. But this young boy, who had a 14 millimeter leg length distance, came back after three months because he was having pain on another side. I, um, and, and we put in all 14 millimeters because he's only 10 years old. And, uh, the previous side that was low was now high. So we took two x-rays, one in his bare feet and one with the lift on. And the one with the lift on showed that he was seven millimeters high. So it was actually shortening the quadratus lumborum and rector spinae on that side. Uh, and I believe that was his left side. And his previous complaints had been on the right side because the right leg was 14 millimeters. And then the second x-ray where he was in, in the barefoot x-ray, he was uh, only seven millimeters short now on the short leg side. And then when he put his lift on, that took him to seven millimeters high on the other opposite side. So he'd actually grown seven millimeters in three months. But he, uh, it's, it's interesting because his parents were charting his growth, and he grew an inch and a half in that three-month period. He went through a, a big growth spurt. His father's six foot six. He's going to be a big boy. Uh, and that's what I thought that was so astounding that 
And Randy and Kevin and I got together and said, look, this, is, this, this information is too outrageous and too important that we really have to start researching this because we didn't really know that big of a change could take place in that short a period of time. So now we've seen as a protocol these children every three months. And we have some evidence, we have two or three other tape studies now that uh, actually uh, children are changing faster than we thought, um, but particularly they change fast if there's a lot of consciousness in the family about a uh, good diet and getting off their time sugars and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I don't know how we build that into a study, but uh, everything <laughs> that, that that's, talking, that's going to be study number 47 yeah, <laughs> that, that we do, test group number 47. Uh, I'm going to throw another question out there from, uh, from Tim Janik, who does not have audio, so I will be his voice, because um, I know we have some stories about, about this uh, question as well. Uh, the question is, is there a connection between lower limb length inequality and ADD or ADHD? Um, and uh, I guess he'll take his answer off the air. <laughs> um, so, uh, Randy, Paul, um, I, I, I know we've had some case histories uh, surrounding learning issues, um, uh, attention deficits, uh, these, these kinds of things. What's, what's been your experience? Paul, do you want to share the story of uh, our friend from Buffalo? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent. Um, uh, a young boy came from Buffalo. He was referred uh, by his father, who is a nationally known naturopathic physician. And uh, he was a uh, failing school. Um, he was a CD student. And he had uh, both a leg length difference and a pelvic difference. And the story he told was really fascinating. Um, because he said to me, just uh, we were at the time weren't looking at pelvic differences that much. So this story is about uh, I don't know seven or eight years old. Um, but what he said to me was that he said, you know, Paul, I can learn when I stand up, but I don't learn very well when I sit down. I said, what do you mean? If I, I Explain that to me. He said, well, it just gets all jumbled in my head. And so my father and I have made up this thing that uh, I have a bladder problem, and uh, I go out in the hall. I don't even really go to the bathroom, but then I've arranged with the teacher that I come back in the classroom, and I stand in the back because I don't want to disrupt the class. And he said, while I'm standing, uh, I can learn better. The words connect together. And I said, but when you sit down, uh, they don't connect together. And he said, that's right. So I said, well, can you show me? And he said, yes. So he stood up and I said, show me how you'd stand. And so what he does, would, just like most people, he, would, he takes the long leg and he, he puts it out wider. And, uh, or he points that knee and drops down, and he can make himself uh, level. But then when he sat down, I measured him and realized he had a hemipelvis. And when you're sitting down, you can't use your legs to compensate or adjust um, your hip height. So basically, you got what you got. And what I noticed is that when I measured his atlas, that when he stood up and corrected, his atlas didn't rotate. But when he sit, uh, sat down and he couldn't uh, adjust his spine and his structure uh, with his legs or use his legs, and he had this hemipelvis that his cranial base tilted and his atlas rotated about 25 degrees, which meant that he was twisting his brain stem. And, uh, we've seen that the most significant relationship to learning uh, is that because the atlas has uh, two concave facets, that this was sig significant. Um, 
because it puts so much pressure on the brain stem and the medulla oblongata, where are, there are all these control centers for not only tonus but um, circulation, uh, because it rotates the the atlas, which causes uh, circulation to be disrupted uh, by the vertebral ar uh, artery, but also the vertebral veins, and that's. We noticed that in uh, um, the migraine study that it was the entrapping of the veins that was causing poor drainage from the cranium. Uh, and it was not the artery being um, uh, arterial circulation, which I initially thought in the migraine study was the problem. But we later showed that it was actually the venous drainage in the head. And that's why migraine sufferers had to get down, lay down, and uh, it would facilitate the pressure going out of their head, and that's why vi uh, vasodilators are successful in treating people with migraines also. It's, it's the venous drainage, it's not the arterial circulation. So you could draw all sorts of conclusions because that circulation goes directly into the circle of Willis and controls all these uh, uh, motor cortex functions. Um, so we think that's significant and, and Nicholas was the first person that I realized uh, the, one the importance of a hemi pelvis and the fact that that children um, uh, or, or adults could adjust more to leg length difference uh, when they were um, standing than when they were sitting down uh, and that's probably a, a whole another study on just hemipelvises, um, but uh, you know, some of the more obvious things are like scoliosis, for example, in children. Uh, every one of these children that go through these scoliotic screenings um, are probably uh, candidates. It wouldn't take that much to expand that um, scoliotic screening that occurs in, in school to include leg length difference um, because we have one blockbuster study of a, a young woman that you know put screws and plates and we actually have her her x-rays when she was diagnosed as full cassette to include her hips and there was significant leg length difference um, but they put the screws and plates in and it was never diagnosed that she had a leg length study or a leg length difference and I I don't remember exactly what that was. I think it was about 15. Maybe. I think 17 is what we ended up. 17? Yeah, I think it was 17. Yeah, yeah but it was significant. Um, and it caused a significant scoliosis. Uh, but that it goes way up into the postural chain. And um, I, I might just add, uh, my colleagues don't know this yet, because I, I just had some dental work, and uh, I've been asked to... Uh, present all this information to the Las Vegas Institute, which is the foremost uh, uh, dental research uh, uh, place in the United States now. And uh, an old friend, Dr. Norman Thomas from uh, the University of Calgary is there on staff. And uh, uh, they, the dental community really wants to get involved because TMJ is a, is a significant uh, has a significant cause in leg length difference and, and all sorts of uh, um, cranial distortions occur because the, these uh, forces of gravity go up the postural chain and into the cranium. Uh, so the possibilities literally are endless for studies uh, and uh, to have uh, an institute, uh, that just happened the other day, so I haven't uh, actually had time to, to talk to my colleagues about this, uh, but I've already pledged that I would go to the Las Vegas Institute and present the children's studies that we compiled uh, to the Las Vegas Institute. And now we, we have uh, two biological dentists here in Clearwater uh, who are very much interested in doing that here on a local level with us and, and partnering us with the study uh, related to dentistry and TMJ uh, in children. 
Well, aren't well, you glad you had that abscess then? <laughs> <laughs> Everything happens for a reason, huh? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, so we're. I know there are more questions. We are running out of time. Um, we will stay on the line here and answer any further questions you do have. What I do want to wrap up with here is uh, this is something that that you all should be checking for. Uh, we wanted to some of what we wanted to impress upon you is the importance of checking the children uh, and correcting them and staying on top of that. Um, I also wanted to pass along that that as you can hear, Paul has a lot to share, and he actually has just committed to teach two seminars before the end of this year. Um, he's going to end up doing a Posturology 101 here in the Tampa Bay area, October 14 through 16, and we haven't even put it on the calendar yet, but we are going to end up doing a, a Bach Flower seminar um, here again in the Tampa Bay area um, the weekend before Thanksgiving, the weekend of the 18th through the 20th and that is a, a all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday event. For those of you who haven't done it, ask us questions about it because it is a very important and it's one we only do every once in a while um, but, but Paul has committed to to teaching it here in November, um, and if you if you can get a chance to take it from him, it it is a good idea. The guy really understands the stuff. Um, so, and the other thing is, uh, we do webinars once a month, and we're actually going to do one next month uh, or n next week. I'm sorry. Um, every Monday, the first Monday of the month at 9 p.m., um, and we go over postural cases and and people send in some of their tougher studies and. We go over their charts and figure out what might be going on. It's a, for those of you who do postural charts, it's a great way to review and, and get some community around that. So, uh, Is there anything you wanted to add, Paul or, or Kevin, before we sign off here? No, I, I think I've uh, you know, added everything. Uh, um, uh, just the importance, if you're working with children, of correcting their gait pattern into a cross pattern. Uh, that is, well, not only in children but in adults because if you're correcting somebody who's 60 years old and they've had a wobbling pattern for 60 years, it takes a little while for them to change, but it really creates uh, so much less arthritis in the spine um, when they develop a, a, a biologically correct um, cross pattern. Uh, that's significant. And you usually need to take a train a spouse on, on how to look for it and they need some encouragement because it usually takes about a month for them to change that that pattern but it, it creates so much less pain in their entire uh, structure uh, if they uh, develop a, a proper cross pattern movement. The only other thing that I would add here uh, at the end is, is that, you know, uh, those of you who, who are listening to in tonight who are therapists, I, I know there are some of you who have, uh, are listening to in tonight who have who've received this work and who are patients. So, uh, but, but to you, the therapists, um, you know, you're, you're all into this work and you're all into this business because, it, you know, you, you get the reward of, of helping folks out of their pain, um, really, really taking care of it uh, with them. Uh, by what you can offer. Um, I find that the reward is just amplified a hundredfold when you can catch a kid um, early in life and, and, and completely change the path that they are on uh, by, by finding something like this. So um, if, if we could, if we could uh, increase our practice here to, to be looking at kids, you know, 90% uh, of, of our practice being kids, I, I think we would all be overjoyed because uh, we, we would we would cut off, <laughs> you know, this this uh, this uh, this faucet of pain that happens in all these adult people that we see. So, really, talk to your patients about this and 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 um, about their kids and about you know 
but kids that they know and, and, and all that kind of uh, thing uh, and, and try to attract them into your treatment room because um, you, you will make a huge difference in their life by, by looking at this. All right. Well, we will. This will kind of be the end of of the actual webinar. Uh, we will stick around on the line to answer any further questions for those of you who do have questions. Um, but thanks for coming, and certainly check out the website or for our schedule or anything like that. And we will hopefully be hearing you or seeing you at a seminar here soon. All right. Thank you.